Hey guys, it's Rachel Castile. Today I'm going to talk about my journey of overcoming pride. And this has been a long journey that God has had me on like over the last 10 years of really bringing me into truth and out of pride and how them going together has been a stumbling block for a lot of years um, that it became a, a humbling journey with Holy Spirit that's began to deliver me from the fact that pride has been driving a lot of my decisions, actions, behaviors, um, my relationships, what I'm seeking, what's motivating me, like in a lot of ways. So I just want to highlight this journey, um, because I feel like it's, it will bless other people. Um, because, and just seeing how much this hijacked my ability to hear the voice of God along the way. Um, it, it really had to be like dealt with in me for me to find like true North to find, um, real rest in my relationship with God and, um, to get me out of these types of realms. Uh, and it's been a blessing. The more God has like built trust with me, um, for me to open my heart more and to realize how hard my heart really has been and how walled up it's been throughout the years. And, um, yeah, living behind a false front and, um, yeah, it's been a journey. So, uh, this video, uh, it's going to be like kind of the depths of my, my journey thus far with God in finding truth, um, in navigating religion wanting to be right, wanting to find truth, wanting to find the right group of people, um, comparing people against other people, cutting people off, all of this sort of stuff was very much normal and rationalized in my heart. And I did it a lot. And I messed up a lot of relationships over this living fearful, um, of not being supported. So then rejecting people first type of stuff. Um, it was very common for me. Um, so yeah, in my journey of like seeking truth, I also wanted approval. I wanted support. I wanted to be, um, in the right group. I wanted to be, I guess you would say admired for being right, being helpful. Um, and yeah, I was, I was like, I was willing to cut people off for this pursuit and it's been a pursuit of truth. I don't want to knock myself too hard. I've been searching for truth. And, um, what God showed me is when God would show me that I, um, made a wrong turn, I would actually turn around, which is humbling. That is getting out of pride. And I've, I've gone in and out and around and back around and then over here and then like, okay, no, I shouldn't have done that. And I need to go back over here and say sorry to this person because I left for the wrong reason. And, um, yeah. And realized how much I was like trying to manage my own issues without actually letting light in. And I went through, um, years of pain and, um, just total self-reliance, um, and trying to fix myself basically and trying to, um, rewrite my story kind of thing. And yeah, I just, I'm very grateful for, um, God's like continued, like, uh, pursuing my heart and like sending people into my life to, uh, give me opportunities to open up, giving me opportunities to let my walls down, to begin to see my value again, to see the benefit of being in community and not just being right and being in the right group and then being great in the right group sort of thing. Um, so my background, I grew up Pentecostal, um, ACI, uh, apostolic Pentecostal, churches in Southeast Texas. Um, it stands for apostolic international churches, I believe. And, uh, this is a much more conservative group of Pentecost than like say UPC, UPCI. Um, we grew up not really fellowshipping with them, uh, depending on like what their standards of holiness was or whatever. But, um, yeah, um, my dad, uh, is the one who brought us into the Pentecostal church. 
He is in his 70s and has been Pentecostal probably for like 40 something years. Um, he grew up, not to tell his whole story, but just a bit of background, like he grew up Catholic and um, his uh, parents, my grandparents owned like a club. So like alcoholism was just very normal to the family. And like he, he was an alcoholic before I was born. And uh, he had very real encounters with Holy Spirit um, that he got delivered from alcoholism in a day, like in a moment. And he went through all these spiritual experiences, like feeling um, like his mind being pulled out of his body, being like lifted up off the bed, like all these really like real spiritual experiences and stuff. And then like really encountered God and like got filled with the spirit. And um, all of this got bundled into his experience of becoming Pentecostal going into that. Um, he went, well, he went from like a, they would call it a looser Pentecost in Houston and then got connected with people in Vider, Texas um, that like brought him into this ACI sort of like group of Pentecost that was much more conservative of like shaving mustaches and like not watching TV, not wearing short sleeves or shorts and, you know, things of that nature that became like, even more right so he went even deeper into like oh this is what righteousness looks like this is what holiness looks like um but in the pentecostal church um one second they believe like jesus name baptism is mandatory that you have to be rebaptized if you're baptized in the father son or holy spirit you know like uh sorry yeah in the in the name of the father son and holy spirit um they believed essentially like that the book of acts what it's detailing is the apostles doctrine and they believe that their church is the perfect representation of the apostles doctrine like not to veer from it um sort of thing that like um it's kind of believes that they're the only ones who have the holy ghost as they say you know they read king james so it's holy ghost <laughs> but uh yeah anyways um like speaking in tongues, being filled with the spirit. Um, that's wonderful. Um, but growing up, it was like Pentecostals have the Holy Ghost. Nobody else does. And the most pillar thing was the oneness doctrine that uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are not separate beings within the one Elohim God. It's that they're literally the same person, that Jesus is the Father, they would say. Um, and that Holy Spirit is just now his spirit poured out but it's it's all the same person essentially idea so that people who believe the trinity are not saved they need to be converted that's like a delusion and you know it's you'd go to hell you're not saved is basically the point so to renounce any of those pieces even down to like how they dress and stuff it's like each each um what do you call it like each pillar all um dictates salvation or not saved and uh, that was just normal. I grew up in that. So it was like, we're right. And I'd hear them preach against other churches all the time growing up. Um, and um, other family members who weren't as Pentecostal. Like I, I definitely heard a lot about them growing up. And, you know, there was, you know, anytime somebody left the church, uh, they were preached against and it was like steer clear of them type of thing. So um, there was, it just became this like, a pride in being right on all these different things. So meanwhile, I knew there was so much not okay in my family, um, in me that I was walking through childhood trauma, just a lot of really jacked up stuff. And, um, but we were churchgoers. We looked the part, like we all like, you know, we're sincere. I would say like sincere in the fact that we believe this is the answer. Like this is it. But, um, yeah, a real dryness that's not being dealt with. Like the spirit's not moving, right? Nobody's being set free. People are being indoctrinated that this is the right train to be on to get out of here. It's that sort of thing. Not that there's freedom. It's the belief that the doctrine will get us to heaven one day, that sort of thing. But um, anyways, I grew up just like hungry, wanting to know like the voice of God. And I was filled with the spirit when I was really young. And, um, yeah, I just, I would, I had a peace in my relationship with God and I did sense that I was being guided, but that I, I needed help. Like I needed to be healed and I knew something was wrong and I was looking, you know, I was riddled with so much anxiety growing up. Like, 
I literally like would be traumatized to just walk out of my room to go to the table. I would be short of breath, just talking, saying a sentence with my brothers, with my family. And, um, yeah, needless to say, I knew something was off and something needed to be fixed. Like we had this good looking package on the outside, but, um, something's off, you know, I need something that we don't have. And, uh, come like the time when I'm graduating from high school, like speaking of high school, I had so much anxiety. Oh my God. Like I, it's like, I think back on high school and it's a literal blur. Like, I don't remember names of people, just some faces. Like, I don't remember my classes. I don't remember the lunchroom. Like I don't even, <laughs> it's crazy. Literally. Like, it's like I was surviving, getting through what I had to do because we, ha we can't be truant. Is that the right word? I don't know. But yeah, we can't not go to school, that sort of thing. And, um, I had visions of things that I knew was in me, but like, they were so locked down, so shut down. I'm like, how am I ever going to sing one day? Like I, I see these things, you know what I mean? And I see that I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I see that I'm going to do this. I see that I'm going to have these communities and I'm going to raise up leaders and I'm going to do all this stuff, but how, like, I'm so bound, you know, that was just my experience at that point. And, um, but yeah, I came across, um, Danny Johnson, which is a, she's a business coach mentor. She's a millionaire who teaches like business skills. Um, and whenever I came out of high school, I was like looking around for like what I would do next. And I was very interested in home businesses, like the network marketing industry. I was like studying all kinds of videos, like obsessively, like learning about business. And, um, yeah, I came across her videos and like the testimonies just like really spoke to me like a light at the end of the tunnel. And I was like, I have to go to this event. I don't know why I've just got to go to this event. Like, um, and, uh, yeah, like, let me stop my phone from beeping. There we go. But yeah, um, I was just like, I gotta go. And like, I was telling my mom and she's told me like, she's like, I was kind of afraid, like just how desperate you seem that like, I went with you, like to make sure you're okay. And, um, yeah, so I wound up going to an event like shortly after graduating high school. And that was like such a war to go because it was like, before I went, I was already like sharing Danny Johnson's videos with my family. And like, it was like turbulence in the family that I was listening to somebody who, um, she's a believer and that she was like speaking from scripture and like teaching and about sowing and reaping and all kinds of different things. And like, it was powerful. And, um, like I could hear God when she spoke and I was like getting truth. Like I was getting something that I needed. And, um, I was sharing her different systems and stuff in the family and it was just like becoming a problem, you know, but like I went to the event, um, we just like, I got in this habit of like selling stuff to go to these events. They were like all over America every like month and a half or so. And I started going and I've also grew up like as, you know, I was about to say a worship leader, but not really. I was uh, playing guitar and drums and bass in the Pentecostal church growing up. So like I was a regular on the um, worship team, basically. And um, yeah, not being there for church was a big deal. Like you don't miss church. You almost need like a doctor's excuse. <laughs> not really, but um, to not be there. And so I was just like this tension within the church, this tension within the family, because I started going to something that um, was not Pentecostal, you know, but, uh, yeah, I started meeting people. Um, and in going to the events, I saw people get healed. Literally people got healed out of wheelchairs, um, got healed of cancer. Like I started hearing all kinds of testimonies and seeing stuff and seeing demons cast out and stuff. And I was like, Whoa, like this is real, you know? And, um, I was just like drinking it up like a very dry, dry, dry plant. Like I needed water. So I didn't even, I wasn't paying attention of whether it was Pentecostal or not. I just was like life, this is life. Right. And, um, I was sharing it with my mom and then I was sharing it with my younger brother. I was sharing it with who I felt would listen basically. And, um, yeah, like if somebody like pushed back, I would just like not share with them again. That was my pattern. It's like stay where I'm supported, stay where I'm understood, stay where um, somebody can hear my thoughts out. And the interesting thing around that time is like I started um, vlogging in my uh, photo booth app on my MacBook back then. Like I started talking to myself because that's how much I needed to talk 
that then like I realized I really needed to talk to my mom and then she became like another place I could talk. And then my younger brother became another place where I could talk. And um, essentially I came to this point of going to the events that I was like developing a lot of vision for my life of that. I knew I would have like a home business and I would do all kinds of stuff. And I was writing up what I wanted to do, what my goals were for the next year, like going into, I think 2024 at that point, I graduated in 2013. And by the time coming to 2024 or no 2014, I was like getting a lot of vision and I, um, wrote up like this 14 page um, like typed it up. So 14 typed pages of like my vision of what I was seeing for my life and stuff and like things I wanted to do. And um, I shared it with my dad and like he read it and he was like, wow, like um, he didn't really discourage me, but he was like, go show it. To, uh, I don't really want to say his name, to be honest, I almost said my pastor's name, but um, this isn't about names. Um but yeah, he told me, go, go share it with a pastor essentially. And yeah, I, I did, I went and shared it with him of like my visions and goals of the next coming year and stuff. And like, uh, Danny Johnson was talking about like having good counselors in your life, like people that you can go to having good counsel. So I was like, Oh, my counsel. Okay. I told my dad and I told my pastor and um like the next sunday after giving him that packet like i was called into the office when i first got there was scolded me and my mom of like this is not apostolic where you're going this stuff does not mix what are you talking about none of this is none of this is apostolic you want to do jujitsu that's not apostolic you want to do this da, 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 da. it was like this long thing and it was like for like 30 minutes or maybe more i don't know um of basically he had like written all over it of scratch things out and essentially yeah that moment was very hard and i had to go right back in and get up on the piano and just move on like nothing happened sort of moment and um everybody knew something was up but anyways went home and it's just like yeah that just happened and um yeah essentially from there um having been given like an ultimatum I started to search more. I was like, okay, going to the events is that much harder. If we decide to go, we're in direct like rebellion, they'd say, to his wishes. Like he said, like, you don't need to go to this. And, um, but yeah, I started searching scripture. I got on YouTube and I came across um, like three different YouTube channels. I don't remember. Well, actually, I'll just explain what I do remember in the timeline kind of unfold. But I came across Chris Lasala. Um, from BDS ministry. Um, I came across um, Doug, I think that's his name from Fellowship of the Martyrs and um, TV Joshua, like those three channels I was really watching. And then um, Torben Sundergaard uh, from the last reformation. I don't remember exactly when I encountered his in that timeline, but yeah, like those four channels, I started watching their videos and um, that really helped me. Um, to dismantle the lies of the oneness doctrine because that's like the pillar thing of like no we're right on this and no other church has this you have to be in a oneness church and then there's debating on the different standards of holiness and they divide over that stuff too but um yeah that was uh the start of me searching scripture in all the pentecostal stuff because i was given an ultimatum of like this does not mix and I was getting vision, like just kind of seeing it all together, like, hey, I'm seeing more stuff. And um, anyways, over the next year, I started to really look into scripture, came across lots of videos uh, showing me um, just more of like the error of the whole oneness idea that the Father, Son and Holy Spirit are the same. Like, it's just no, it's a lot of twisting of scripture. But um yeah, I just went and like full out, like, I'm going to look at everything. Nothing's true until I see truth. All these things, I'm going to allow God to show me what is actually true. And that came to about the that whole year of that. And I shared a, everything like that journey with my mom and my younger brother. And um, yeah, it was like, I was... I was afraid to be honest, like I knew what, what I was getting into 
And I was afraid to lose my mom. I was afraid to lose my younger brother. Really, it's everybody, but it was like, who is hearing me out? Like, who's supporting me in some sense? And um, yeah, I went through a lot of pain. I've cried a lot in the, uh, how do I put it? The separation, yeah. Um, in learning to not control to just let things be, let people be, let people make their own decisions and be my own person. So, but yeah, I was very scared to say the least to leave. And, um, yeah, it came to a point that, um, my mom actually mentioned in a joke to my, one of my brothers about one thing I know for sure. I know Jesus ain't his father, which was something that was like, a statement from a, a lot of, um, changing of beliefs, basically to say that as a Pentecostal. And I was like, Whoa, this just started. And like, it became like, where's Rachel? I know that this has to do with her. It turned into a seven hour debate between my whole family. And that resulted in us not living there the next day. So, um, yeah. Um, for like six months after that, we lived in, we, as in my brother, my mom, and me, we lived like 30 minutes away. And yeah, I felt at that point, like it was just this war of try them trying to bring us back to being Pentecostal and me trying to be like, no, we don't need to be Pentecostal. I want to think for myself sort of thing. And, um, long story short, my brother passed, um, one of, I have a lot of brothers. I have six brothers. So the brother right above me, um, not the one that's younger than me who actually left too at, in that season, but, um, essentially, but yeah, my brother right above me, he drowned and he drowned, like, I would say like five months after, um, we left the Pentecostal church. And in that time period, our family came back together, everything, you know, we moved back, um, into the family house and everything. Um, uh, my mom, my brother went back to the Pentecostal church. I did not. Um, and like a month later, I decided to move away um, near people that I had met through the Danny Johnson events, the San Antonio area. Um, their company is based in the Hill Country area. And I just like up and moved. Like it was like I had that apartment we were living at um, during that let like five, six months. And then now it's like, we're all back in the family house. And I was just like, no, no, I, I don't want to live with people trying to make me be Pentecostal. Like, and it was like this thing of like, okay, where am I going next? Cause I'm not, I'm not staying here sort of thing. And, um, yeah, I kind of just decided on a whim of like, okay, I could live anywhere. I could live in Houston. I could live in Beaumont. No, nah, I'm going to live in San Antonio. And I just went and signed a lease and I moved within a month after like the funeral and everything. And, um, yeah, um, it's a very long story, but essentially from there, I wind up getting into Kerrville, Texas, which is where I really settled for the next like five to so years in that general area. I wind up started going to a church there that became my home church. And like, they were like family to me. And I got involved in the youth, um, like young adults, um, in the beginning met really good people. And, um, essentially I got rooted in a good job, got on the worship team and that was my new home. And I wasn't looking back. I had no intention of moving back. Um, I would talk to my mom like on the phone, but I didn't really go back. I went back for like Christmas, um, occasional birthdays and stuff, but like, I, I like, didn't like being around them at all. Like, to be honest, like I didn't like um, I would call it judgment, the judgment, the, um, the lack of support. I think that's what hurt me the most is that I wanted support. I wanted to be understood. I wanted to be, um, celebrated. I think it's the best word to be celebrated, to be cheered on in this journey of discovering truth. And I was leaving some, I was leaving a place where they believed they had truth and, um, yeah, the pain of all of that, like the way I processed it and how guarded my heart was throughout all of that, like it just caused me like that same like pride that, that kicked me out 
that rejects who I actually am, that rejects um, where I'm going as a good thing, rejects my influence. I think the biggest thing that um, I was afraid of or was told, accused that my influence was bad, that my influence is negative. Um, it's not a good thing. When you speak, you're being controlling. And I think that's just, that comes from being in a controlling environment that having, having your own mind and being able to speak and being able to share those thoughts with anybody that you have a, a connection with. It's like that being labeled as control, that just means I'm in a controlling environment that I can't say something differently, you know, but that being said, just that, that type of environment, it just made me like antagonistic. It made me like guarded, made me like, like I needed to protect myself, that sort of thing. And it, it's kind of sent me on a journey of like looking for what is right, wanting to be in the right group. So it's the same type of pattern that I see in my dad, to be honest, like that he's found the right group and he's cut himself off from everything he had before. And like we were raised very much tucked away in the Pentecostal world and our family, you know, I, I didn't grow up all that connected to my cousins, aunts and uncles, grandparents, none of that. It was like, they were not Pentecostal is my experience growing up. And, um, yeah, so that was, that was just, that was the environment, the, that's what I was brought up in, you know? So but from there, I went on to move into Kerrville and Kerrville became like my new safe place, my new family. Um, really the supportive environment that I wanted, like people that accepted me for who I am, for what I believed and were encouraging me in some way. Um, that's like what I required basically. I think that's, has a lot to do with why I moved away. It was like, I, I needed to be in a supportive environment is how I experienced it at that time that it seemed necessary that it was like, I wanted to be around somebody who could, um, support where I was going. And yeah, I didn't have that. I, I felt, I didn't feel that I could trust, um, the influences in my life to lead me in the right direction. It was almost like if I have any run in with somebody about where I'm going, then that's going to hurt with somebody that I love. So I just, yeah, I started to cut people off that I thought would reject me at some point. It's like, if you're not going to do it now. You may do it later, that sort of thing. And, uh, yeah, there was that heart pattern that Kerrville became a place where I was, um, I was known or I was embraced, I guess. And, um, yeah, so I started going to, um, impact church in Kerrville, Texas. And, uh, that became my home church for most of my time in Kerrville. I was in Kerrville for nearly like five years, something like that. Um, from like 2015 until 2020. So yeah, I was in that general area, but, um, yeah, so this pattern of like finding a group of people that support where I'm going and me looking for truth and me still, my heart being very like shut down, I was just like navigating what is true and what is uh, not, what is, um, who, what group should I be in? What group should I be great in? Kind of, you know, like um, what community should I really root in, you know, root myself in? And, uh, yeah, so like this, this undercurrent of this, like pride of being right. Um, I kind of, this led me in cutting groups of people off, like, uh, the Danny Johnson group that brought me to Kerrville basically brought me to the hill country. Um, I then came to a point where I was like, oh no, I shouldn't be around these people either. This right here is wrong. And this is, um, you know, feeling that I needed to go to events every other month or I was going to be a failure. That's how I processed it. Right. I was just like, no, this is wrong. And I, I like, uh, either got off of Facebook or unfriend most people I knew from there. And I basically went like from that group into the church group and got, you know, on the worship team, I got, um, got involved with young adults. Um, 
I was working at Papa John's when I first got there. And then um, I started working at James Avery and that just became like James Avery impact. And the people of those two places became like everything. And um, I met my friend Mercedes. Um, we both started like doing um, home worship sort of things like uh, home group worship at different things at impact. And uh, yeah, that just became like a solid friendship I had. And then I had another friendship um, that was very pivotal in my life. Um, whenever I first moved to Kerrville, they were like a family who like took me under their wings. And, um, and then another family that like was really rooted in James Avery and in impact. And that was just kind of like these three central relationships in my life there. And, um, yeah, I also, it's a, it was even more than that, but it was like four pivotal like friendships that I was kind of like hanging on, um, of like support in some way. And, um, well, at that point though, I kind of, this, all this wrestling in me and like this, not, um, not feeling supported, um, by my family, like all the pain of all of that. Like I, at that point started like looking around and not trusting their church anymore. I started looking back at the deliverance ministry. I'd have a friend that would talk about like Todd White and Dan Moeller. Um, and I'd go really into that, but then I'd go over to this other thing. And I was just like, pitting all these different belief systems against each other. And, um, yeah, I started struggling, um, with just other things in my heart at that point too, that I was like wrestling with and trying to manage on my own. And in the midst of all of that, trying to just be right, trying to find the right group, trying to paint a vision of my future in the midst of what was going on in my heart and trying to like decide which people to be connected to, which community to, I, I experience it. It's like rise up in, like, I want to be great in a sense. Like I want, I want to use my gifts, but where should I use them? Who's, who's going to mentor me almost that sort of thing. Um, what are the, who are the right people to be connected to? And I would like have a really close friend and then I would cut them off and then I'd go over to the other friend, like, okay, I'm over here now. And, um, I did that a lot. Like I, yeah, it was crazy. But in the midst of all of that, like I was going to impact and, um, I was living, this is a lot of detail. That's kind of personal to a lot of people, but I was living on the property of a family and they were renting it out. And, um, my friend Mercedes and I, we were roommating there. And, um, in that time period, um, I started getting back into watching Chris LaSala, the deliverance ministry, and um, I think Torben Sundergaard and Todd White at that point. And then it was like this big thing where it was like things that, that Chris was talking about. I was like, oh, Todd, this stuff is bad. And I was like, oh, all this Bethel stuff is bad. This church is very rooted in Bethel and Bill Johnson and um, the Toronto revival sort of people like Randy Clark and... Heidi Baker. And I was just like, Oh no, all this is bad. I started watching all these YouTube videos that was against all of that. Um, that like Benny Hinn was like of a false spirit, all this stuff like this, um, this, like the similar pride of being Pentecostal that, um, I found in this like deliverance ministry in a different way. Like I started wearing a head covering. I left impact. Um, my friend and I, we both left impact. We moved, um, we were working on day shift at James Avery. We both moved to night shift. We moved out of that house because that family was connected to that church. And it was just like this thing that whenever I would feel that, okay, I have something, but other people are going to try to control me out of seeing it. They're going to try to make me see it their way. I've got to leave. I got to find a safe place, that sort of thing. Like I need to be in a neutral zone where nobody's trying to control me sort of thing. And to be honest, like I talked my friend Mercedes into moving with me, like, um, not to make this all about people, but yeah, that was, that was a season that like, I did really hurt her equally in the way that I feel like I hurt my brother, um, my younger brother and, um, my mom and like, I need y'all to go with me in order for me to step away from something. I feel like I need to step away from 
So it was like, I was feeding her everything. I was seeing everything. I was thinking about stuff, giving her videos to watch. And it was like, we need to leave. Like, let's not be here, you know? And, um, long story short, um, yeah, we moved away like 30 minutes away. Like I just, this is the craziness of my journey, but yeah, we moved away, went to that deliverance ministry and, um, yeah, we went there probably like four months or so. We would go up there every once a month or something. Cause it was far away, but, um, yeah, like I got rebaptized there and, um, it was like this whole thing of like, like I was, I was, I don't know how to put it. Like I was getting deliverance. I really was. I got real deliverance there. So I not wanting to, this video is not about who's right or who's wrong. It's more so the journey of the fact that I was making decisions that way, pitting people against each other. But, um, I went there in pride. I went there in like, I'm going to the right group and I'm going, I'm getting away from these other people that have been in my life for the last few years. It's like, nope, I don't want to be around them. They're going to try to influence me. Um, and yeah, we both went out there and, uh, our eyes opened to a lot of things. Like that was the craziest, driest season of having to come to the end of that. I was like, man, I, I messed up, you know? And, um, I wound up, uh, reaching out to some people in, um, Torben's ministry, the last reformation that were in the San Antonio area. And I got rebaptized again out of being over at that place and got baptized there. So, but this journey of like overcoming my pride or facing myself and seeing myself and actually surrendering this thing that I've been using to uh, make decisions, like it was cutting off and messing up my relationships. I would cut people off just because I didn't want them to see truthfully how prideful I really was in my decisions. It was like, y'all are wrong. I know better and y'all are dangerous. Like it was the same thing that hurt me. The same thing that I was like raised up in that I saw displayed that I, I literally was doing that. Like I did that over and over. And, um, yeah, I don't have many relationships from Kerrville having been there for five years, um, that I didn't burn bridges with in some way while I was there. Um, but, uh, yeah, so we decided not to go to that ministry in that capacity, like being that like rooted in everything that they believe, um, and there was still that element of like, I'm under some type of group. What's the right group? And I'm going to be good in that group instead of it's like me and God and my calling and what I'm supposed to be doing and hearing the voice of God. This stuff was in the middle of it that was causing me to not just seek truth, seek my identity, seek the voice of God to know God and be led by the spirit. This pride was leading me. Um, this pride, shame, fear of rejection. Um, if anybody knows the Enneagram, I'm an Enneagram type two and seeing my Enneagram type later, having walked through this journey and Holy Spirit started to humble me. I'm like, Whoa, this is what was going on. Um, like wanting to be important in some community by, yeah, having chose the right one, I'm going to rise up in it sort of thing. And, uh, anyways, um, meanwhile, this story has so many things to it, but um, before we left that church and moved to Bernie, we left, so the church is in Kerrville. We moved to Bernie, like 30 minutes away, went to night shift and then started going to a deliverance ministry. Um, we had signed up to go on a mission trip to Peru, um, with impact church. There's a lot of people going. And in the middle of all of that, as we decided to move away, we also, uh, decided to withdraw from going on the trip with them, but to go on just like some random uh, reassignment to whoever we'd land with. Cause this trip, um, was approaching in the summer. And I think we, we left around new year's and the trip was like in June or July. And, um, we had a lot of people donate to us and like our trips were like basically paid for. I think at that point, people, um, really amazing people bought our passports and everything like was like really supporting us and going. 
and uh, we called the mission trip people and got reassigned so that we'd be in a different um, a different airport leaving in a different um, different city when we did get to Peru like total reassignment that we wouldn't even like run into the impact people like that was like the state I literally was in it was like no I, I don't want to be around them it was crazy right um but yeah so that was going on to heading towards this trip we were talking i say we see this isn't i still bring somebody along so it's a we thing instead of a me thing but i at that point um was talking against the mission trip group that we were going on the mission trip with it's like that i they were part of the bethel sort of people it was like we're going on this trip and like what what uh they're about isn't even like good and like um yeah i was literally like the fruit of their ministry isn't bearing the right thing you know um like as though it was like this false message like leading people to christ wasn't enough type of thing that i was back under again and i i get it some people can walk in more power they can walk in more purity they can walk in more like all these different things um but yeah i was back judging parts of the body and going you know what no but i feel like i'm supposed to go and like we're still going on the trip people had invested so much money in us and um yeah prior to going to the trip though like a month before it that's about a month to two i think we had decided to stop going to the deliverance ministry then i started to like seek god and like i was like i i need help i want like a new start again and um that's when i reached out and got rebaptized and like started to open up to some people from the last reformation ministry and um yeah my heart was just like struggling a lot but um yeah i was just like god it's just me and you like i want to go on this trip i want you to speak to me like show me what i need to see like guide me and um that was just in God's mercy, like starting to humble me, starting to like build trust with me in my pride that I'm like, I'm gonna go on this trip in pride of like, I've separated myself from these other people. And I just know that God's speaking to me and I'm gonna go do God's work, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and I'm with all these people that I don't even want to be with. Right. But I'm gonna go do God's work because I know God's going to show me something. And that's still true, right? Because God's that way with us as his children. But it was that like, it was God's loving me in my condition and was saying, I'm going to show you something. And I saw so much on that trip. Like I healed people for like the first time. I feel like I, I may have healed a few people prior, but like that was real. Like there were so many people that got healed. I pray for people. They like start throwing up demons and stuff like vomiting and stuff and be like set free from stuff. Hands healed. Um, literally ladies hands didn't open for three years open. Like when I prayed and like just, it was so much of that. I was on a healing, uh, I was on a ministry team or prayer team of a medical team. So I got to just walk around and pray for anybody with a translator and um, Mercedes and I, we both did that. And, um, there was like another, like a couple other people from other parts of the world, the country, um, that were on that team with us as well. And, um, that on that trip, I, I saw my heart more than ever. Like I saw how guarded my heart was. I saw how scared my heart was, like how ashamed my heart was. Um, and I saw just like, what what was available for me too like i saw i had so much vision i started to see my identity i started to feel the calling on my life in the midst of that and um like i can't unexperience peru peru was so incredible on on so many levels because like i saw myself in all ways i saw what was going on in my heart i saw that if i wanted to move forward i had to surrender i had to let go and um yeah and I, I also like, I had my GoPro, I bought my GoPro before the trip. Cause I wanted to take it. And that was the beginning of filming. That was the beginning of like documenting and like YouTube and like all of this vision towards like capturing moments 
of um, God moving. And, um, but it was also the struggle of my shame, the struggle of my unworthiness, the struggle of like, if I let people in, if I talk to somebody like, um, at that point in my life, like Mercedes was like the only person I genuinely would talk to. She was the only person I let know me basically. Um, the only person I didn't feel condemned around. And, um, yeah, so I just, I basically like came to a point that I had to like, see um the wall that I had with all the other people on the trip like there were people from like other countries um other states that were on the trip and I met really amazing people that I could tell I was not letting in like I was performing to be around them still and um I had one pivotal moment well two there's two people that one that we roomed with that was really amazing. She spoke a lot of life into me, but another one, um, I'm trying not to say so many names, but like, I'll just say her name, Joani. Um, she is from Florida and man, I chose to open up to her and just tell her how riddled with anxiety I was and like how scared I was to open up. Like, to really let somebody be my friend. And like, it was the most humbling, like weird moment for me, like weird as in like, I felt so ashamed in that moment. And, uh, yeah, it was just like, yeah. Hey, friendship is a risk in that sense of like, you can get hurt if you let somebody in but you could learn something new, you know? And, um, yeah, I had a moment where like, I talked to her for like maybe three hours and in between one of the days and, um, coming out of that trip, like I had like that moment, it was like some real moments with like a few other people that went on the trip that actually lived like very close to where I I grew up, like where I went to school. And which was crazy that we're in Peru and I meet people who lived in Louisiana down the street from me. And, uh, when I was like in high school and stuff, but yeah. And being out there, like, um, I felt myself open my heart for like a moment and then I opened my heart and I saw something else. And, uh, but as we were heading back to fly back, I could feel my heart shutting back down of like, no, 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 no. Like, um, like I was going back into that, that safe place of rigidity a bit. I could feel a closing back in of me not being willing to, to, to live seen all the way. And yeah, we got back and shortly thereafter, I totaled my car. Like I straight up ripped the wheel off of my car, hit a curb, looking inside of a building, uh, to see if they were open, like a place, a eating place. And it like tore my tire off. And then I wound up getting a new car and like that month of coming back whenever all that happened, I feel like that happened within like a month of being back. I would just sit in my room and listen for the voice of God. I would just sit there like going, no, God, I know you, I know what I experienced in Peru. What do I need to do? My heart is so like this, you know, like what does freedom look like? Is it me navigating who's right? And what should I do next? It's like, oh, I was in this place of like, I shouldn't go to churches. The church is outside the four walls. I kind of got that from Torben's ministry of watching the last reformation movies and stuff, which is incredible. Like, but yeah, I was in this state of man, just feeling the dead endness of my decision-making. And I was just like, what, what does forward look like? And I would just sit expectingly like, God, I need you. I need you. Show me what to do. Show me what to do. And I started to get specific visions of what to do next. Um, I got a vision of living back on the mountain in the family's house I was staying at. And I got visions of going back to Impact Church, going talk to my pastor. And I was just like, 
this is what I'm supposed to do. This is the next thing. Like I, I knew it's that thing that's been common for me. It's like, I see, I know it's God. So I say yes. And then that journey is like the hell I needed, like the humbling process I needed. Um, it's like signing up for the boot camp, and I realized God's journey truly in me was to begin to humble my pride through the things he told me to do. And um, within like a month, well, after seeing that, it took about a month, still some time. So you could think of like a couple of months of sitting there, listening to God, getting clarity to really know like this is what I need to do. And um, I I uh, saw very clearly to call the lady that I was living with um, or on her property that she was renting out to me. And like they said, I could come back and live there um, till my lease was up and stuff. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to get back on day, day shift. I saw that getting back on day shift. I did all of that. And then, whoo, yeah, that was that was some journey to like go back all the places I left and just be like, I was wrong. I missed it. You know, I learned what I needed to learn, but yeah, that was very, um, hard time in my life, but I, I saw the fruit of it in me. I'm like, this is what I needed. I need humbling moments instead of, Oh, I'm right. And then, Oh, I'm right again. And then I'm right again. So I'm turning against and I'm right again over here. And then I'm turning over here and I'm going to, I know how I'm going to fix my own issues. I know how I'm going to heal myself. I know how I'm going to get to my future. It's like, I know, like I was still in control of like how I was still like dictating how I would fulfill my calling and how I would find what it looks like. I need to go over here. I need to not be around these people, all this sort of thinking. And yeah, it was like one humbling thing after the next. I got very specific instructions. It was like, okay, next thing, I need you to go talk. Um, I'll just say names. Yeah, I love these people, but go talk to Morgan. Go talk to Jody. Go talk to Sharon. Go talk to um, all these people. And um, you need to tell them what's been going on with you. You need to tell them what you've walked through. You need to really open up. And um, I did. And I felt like the breaking of this stuff on my heart like each one of those moments it was like like the sun was on me like I felt light and uh yeah I went and talked to my pastor from that church in Kerrville and I went back and talked to the day shift managers and like all those moments were like mumbling but freeing like that pattern was breaking finally and uh I got back on the worship team and then COVID happens. Like that was like that summer I came back and then come around New Year's, March time, COVID happens and I'm furloughed from my job. I'm sitting there and I'm in that house and I don't want to move back. I don't want to move back to Beaumont, the Golden Triangle where I'm from. And uh, this was a pivotal moment. I brought up Joani earlier, um, a friend that I met in Peru because like I knew it was like these these connections that I had choices to open my heart to let somebody in to let light in to be real to be honest um beyond the pride beyond the I don't need anything I'm good I'm doing great and I'm like I'm not doing good I've I got a lot a lot going on in me that's not okay you know and uh anyways there comes a moment in being furloughed that Mercedes and Joani decided hey let's meet up on zoom and catch up. We haven't talked to each other since the trip. And I felt my heart in light of talking to them again. I talked to Mercedes here and there, but when I moved back, um, we had a lease together. I moved back to Kerrville and she was still in Bernie. She was still on night shift. I went to day shift. Like I, I then left her where she was in going back, but that was my like repentance. But yeah, that was, um, a hard time too. But, um, anyways, I, I met like, or no, they, they met up on zoom and like, I made up excuses like, oh no, like I got this going on and like, I, I'm not gonna be able to get on. And, um, I felt like after I said that I got on the phone with my mom and I was like, she was like, I think we were like on, on FaceTime, like I was cooking a meal and I would call her sometimes like for her to help me like 
how do you make gravy? How do you do this? And um, I was just like filling up my evening with something else. And I just had it weighing on my spirit, like so strong. Like, no, you're supposed to be on the call with them. And you just made up excuses because you have anxiety and you're afraid. And um, they were already talking for like an hour, I think, without me. And I was like, mom, I got to go. I'm supposed to be on that call. Like, I'm, yeah, I was wrong. And I got on the call late and like, I just told them the truth. Like I told them, like, I'm struggling with anxiety and like, I didn't want y'all to see, um, what I was feeling really like how I feel right now. You know, it was that like that my heart had closed up again. And it was like the next thing you need to open up, you know, you need to be real. You need to tell people where you really are. You, you, it's not just like, Oh, I'm good. I'm get back on the worship team. We just do all the things that I was doing before. And, um, in everything being shut down, there is no worship team in COVID. There is no job and filling all my time with stuff. And then, uh, connecting with people is optional, right? Like if I wanted to just live so controlled and focus on whatever I think I'm doing, um, I realized I was just avoiding something I didn't want to see in myself, you know, and uh, I got on that call. I, I don't remember. I may have cried, but like I was just like I was just let myself be seen, you know, and um, it's like we didn't talk about nothing super like significant in a sense, but like that call changed my life, like that choice to get on that. Um, it's like that going the wrong way, letting pride dictate things and then turning around. It's like, I've had this reluctant, like turning around. Ah, I can feel that I'm doing the wrong thing. So I turn around, but still choosing the wrong thing a lot of times, you know? And, um, but that was so pivotal because that phone call, like, I think it may be the next day or two. I literally know I heard clear as day. And it was because I got on that call because I chose to acknowledge the voice of God telling me, no, you get on that call. You talk to them and you be real. You open your heart. Um, I heard clear as day. Having just told my mom, my mom said something about, you should move back because I'm furloughed. I'm just sitting there um, in Kerrville. And I was like, went off on her. I was like, no, like, I don't want to move. Like, I'm never moving back. What do you, don't try to, don't try to control me. Don't try to tell me that sort of thing. You know, that was very common for me to say that to her. And, um, but I heard clear as day out of the blue. I was sitting, they've got this amazing, like, back um what's the word dang it balcony not balcony it's like a, a sunroom on the back of the house that I was living at that you can see over Kerrville it's like up on a mountain and I would sit back there all the time to just like hear God or just listen and I was sitting there and I heard clear as day move back to Beaumont it's time to go home I was like oh I was like, dang, I just sat there and took it in for a little while. And I was like, I'm supposed to move back. And then I started seeing like, you will work for your family. You'll do this. You'll meet your husband soon. And I was like, okay. And I called my mom and I was like, mama, I don't even know how to say this. You're not going to believe it. But like, I'm moving home. She's like, what? And she started crying and just like losing it. What? My baby's coming home. But <laughs> Anyway, um, I was like, yeah. So then I started looking, I signed a lease on a place and I had that same, it's funny in hearing God, I was still like, oh, these people in Kerrville, they're going to try to control me to like stay here. <laughs> I need to hurry up and sign a lease before I tell people. So I'm committed to it. Like, so people don't try to convince me not like, it's the same thing of like, you can't trust nobody. And like, you got to watch out for yourself. You need to like, get it all your ducks lined in a row, ducks in a row. Um, for when you tell people, because people are always going to try to pull you in this other direction. And what I'm looking at is that thing in me that goes like, I want support and I don't want rejection. I don't want somebody disagreeing with me. I don't want somebody telling me I'm wrong. I can't, I can't deal with that from somebody that I love or that I respect or that I value in some way, um, that I want their support and celebrating me. I want them to come around me in my big moments, you know, and I was afraid of that. Um, from this new group of people that became family to me in me being away, you know? And, uh, yeah. But anyways, I was hearing God. I knew I was hearing the voice of God and I just like started fasting. I started praying a lot. Like, cause I still 
wasn't moving home for like another three months or something, even though like I knew I was moving home. And then I started to tell people um, that I was moving. And uh, that was like the hardest time I went through another like the last like two months, my heart was just like hurting to leave Kerrville. But I like heard God say it. So I committed to it. And then I went through the pain because I didn't actually want to leave. It, it was it was it's interesting. It was like I had left these people, cut them off, came back and still they were still that first group of people that. I feel, I felt love from, you know, not to say my family doesn't love me, but just when I started to develop my own thinking and my own reasoning and becoming independent, they were the ones who came alongside me. And so I felt that they knew me more than the people I grew up with sort of thing. Walk through my hardest moments have seen me at my worst. And, um, yeah, that was just, it was hard for sure, but I moved back and, um, yeah, I, um, long story short, started going to a church, um, met somebody at a Kevin Zadai event that invited me to this church, which is amazing. Like, and because of that person, I then met my husband at that church, but, um, in Beaumont, um, but yeah, then I went through a journey like this hearing the voice of God and like meeting my husband to marry him. It's like this another humbling experience to walk through. Um, and this thing in me that wants a supportive group around me. And then God keeps calling me to do stuff that is making people reject me, making people disagree with me, making people come against me, making people um, oppose me and stuff. So this process of humbling me and getting me over pride, like the root of pride is asserting yourself in something that you're not in some way. So it's like being out of your identity. And it's like, I realize I've been living in a false identity and maintaining it. And when God's awakening my real identity, it's conflicting with all of that. It's causing my real identity is causing me to not live in those patterns that I was relying on for so long, you know? that I thought it was who I was. Like I, I had to have support. I had to have, had to be appreciated. I had to be understood. And I'm realizing like, I don't have to have any of that to be who I actually am, but who I began, you know, being in pride, this, this person I created, this person I learned to live as so that I was, you know, protecting the ego of this person who was right and who was helpful and communities and in churches and getting back on worship teams and being somebody in a church community thing. Like I had to, I had to get out of everything I've embedded myself in again. It's like embedding myself in a place where I can be important, where I can be that valued there, where I can be understood. I can be supported. I can be celebrated and, um, all this stuff that God's like, all that's gotta go. Are you ready? Are you ready? Or you want to still go, th you know, like, it was, yeah, it's been, it's been a lot. I'm thinking this video is a bit long, but this is my journey, man. This is my life. Um, yeah. But in meeting my husband, it was like the most humbling thing too, because I knew what God was doing and I had so many people against me. It's so many people to this day who still think I've made a wrong decision, you know? And, um, that's, that's been the most amazing refining process as I go back to hearing the voice of God saying, go, go to Peru anyways, in the midst of your pride. Um, now go back to Carville, go back to everything you left and repent to those people because relationship matters more than being right. Can't you walk in the spirit and be something and to all people and build up other people. And this is where I'm starting to learn the true function as a prophet and, in, in my role to stir up the real identity and other people and awaken them. So this cutting people off thing, all of this was literally has to die for the real me to function. And what I really am called to do is I need to be connected to lots of people. Like that's my calling is to like be all over. And, um, also why I love YouTube and the internet. Cause I'm like, this is where I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be on the internet. I just know it. And, um, but yeah, it was like the the voice of God calling me 
calling out the real me, guiding the real me to where I needed to be to meet my divine appointments, to realize certain things I don't need to serve anymore. This fear of man stuff, this needing support. It's like, no, you need to be you and you need to speak. You need to, you need to declare what God has shown you. Like even whenever I was seeing stuff about leaving the Pentecostal church, um, when I started my YouTube channel and stuff after getting married and like God started showing me, you need to speak on these things. I was just like, God, how am I going to do that? And I like didn't for like six months. And, um, yeah, as I've gotten started in speaking and sharing, like God's just showing me like, you have things I told you to speak. Are you going to deliver the message? Are you going to do it? You know? And there's just thing after thing, like God's having me deconstruct so many things. And it's like, I get attacked for it. And I realize like God's saying like, that's what you're sent to do. You do what you're called to do. You do what you tear down what I tell you to tear down. You don't, you don't go underground or silence the message or change it or twist it so that people don't come against you in some way or, you know, turn against you is more so a better way to say it. And God's just like, I, I, I've had to walk through this with God to weed this out of me, to weed this pride, the pride being, um, me living as something I'm not me hiding, hiding. I've been hiding my whole life in some way, hiding what I believe, hiding what I think, um, hiding it in just a couple of relationships where a few people know me because those two places are safe and nowhere else is safe. Like that kind of living that just cuts off my influence. It cuts off my whole purpose. Like I'm not supposed to live in a small space like that. Um, I'm so grateful for relationships, friendships, everything. And I see even more like God's calling me to reconnect with a lot of different people that I have cut off. Like I've done that countless friendships. There's some people I'm like, oh yeah, I just burned that bridge. Um, maybe one day they'll forgive me. And if not, that's, it is what it is. And sometimes, and also my journey is very confrontational in the things that God has called me to talk about. And I'm like, I have distance in relationships because that's just how it is. You know, I have to choose my calling first. I have to be obedient to God first. I have to be a voice first. Um, I got to be me. I can't be half of me to keep people. And I did that my whole life. That was the pride. That was, that was the pride, the fear, the fear of rejection. But it's like, I'm right. I'm just going to be right over here. And I'm going to smile at you when you come in front of me and say like, oh, we're good. Right. And I was like, genuinely, I was hurt by that behavior in my family, in the Pentecostal circles, that it's a lot of like smiling with judgment sort of thing. Um, yeah. And what was I? The same person, the same thing. Um, that same pattern of like, I won't really on a heart level be here with you. I'm here with you, but I'm not here with you. You know what I mean? And I, God, God's done that work in me day by day. Like it's just piece by piece. I worked for my family's business. They're very much still Pentecostal, like in working for them for a couple of years, like I needed to do that. Like I needed, I worked for another Pentecostal lady who cleans houses as a, um, cleaning business. And that was also God. Like I needed to see my heart. I needed to learn to love, um, and genuinely be there with Pentecostal people. Um, I'm called to help Pentecostals. I know it or people who used to be Pentecostal. Like I have to, I gotta, I can't self-protect. I can't, you know, reject people that might reject me when I'm the one who's the connector. Like I got to embrace my influence. That's what God's just telling me right now. And I just feel the, in talking about pride, like it's just to open up because this has been my journey. Um, yeah. If you're interested in personality related stuff, the Enneagram is incredible. I have another channel. My life coaching business is typology corner on YouTube. It's also typologycorner.com. But as an Enneagram type two, like this life journey is mine. So if you're a two, you probably relate to this a lot. Um, yeah, not opening up, acting like you don't have needs, not uh, just making sure that everybody's always um, believing that you're okay when you're not okay. It's like going, just denying that, you know, it's almost, it's feeling that it's selfish to talk about yourself. So you just like be in tune with other people, be helpful to other people, all of this, like, and yeah, I just, this, 
thing that I'm so glad Holy Spirit's began to dismantle in me so that I can actually be myself because this life pattern would keep me from being me for the rest of my life. Like, and, um, in me experiencing this breakdown of all of this, I'm like, oh my God, we all need to be free. <laughs> ah, we all need to be free and I want to help people. So yeah. Um, what else to say? Yeah. I I'd actually taken a bunch of notes in like of all the things that I feel like God was that I wanted to highlight in my journey, but, um, I guess a capstone on this is God has me confronting this Christianity stuff. That's like, that says to play small, to not believe what God has made us to be in being born again. Cause that's part of it too. It's like, um, it's not pride to believe that you are divine. It's not pride to believe that I am what God is. Like that is a reality that being born again has made me. So as God is like giving me more and more revelation, I'm speaking, I'm stepping into it. Like this is my influence. And if I'm influential with these things and whatever comes with that comes with it, because this is what God has given me and I will speak it, you know? And, uh, but man, I'm telling you, this is like the process of how God is humbling me with giving me something that makes me have to it test the revelation that I'm living in, you know, and, uh, to continue on. So, um, but yeah, that's another big aspect is that false humility is being less than what God made you to be. So just the more I get in alignment with my identity, the more, I'm getting free from pride, which Christianity will label, um, agreeing with God as pride. You, th who do you think you are that you're equal with God? It's like, I am born again of the spirit of God. I am God's literal child. So I just believe it. And I know that I am, and I'm going to live as that. And I'm going to be the carrier of the presence. And I, I am a divine appointment in this moment because I am divine. <laughs> I am born again. I actually believe what that did in who I am. So how God's like really, really coming at pride and uprooting it at its root is in this place, in this place where God has given me the revelation of divinity is where, um, I see how we all are living lower than where we're really seated to live. And that real humility is being every bit of what God has made you to be. Um, to occupy your God-given space. Um, I think the word is anava. I can look it up, but um, um, the Hebrew word for actual humility is to, to occupy your God-given space, to fully be who you are, nothing less and nothing more. And so when we look at what we're made to be, like we need to, in order to do the greater works that Yeshua did to do greater than what he did, we've got to know that we are what he is now that we're born again. Now that we are walking in that same anointing, we're not just following him. We are another anointed one and everything we do on earth flows out of that revelation of union, of being one. We are one with Elohim. I am in Christ. He died that I would live. Like I, I am an eternal, immortal being that is divine. And we all are, this isn't something for me. This is what calling the real identity up in everybody else is like to wake everybody else up to their divinity. It doesn't make me somebody great. We are all great. And we need to stop, um, thinking that being small is humble. It's not at all. It's pride to assert in God's face and say, you're wrong. I'm right. I'm right that I'm just going to be this little, I want to just keep seeing myself as a servant and not a friend, not a son. So yeah, this is the, the long journey, man. Um, that I've avoided my identity because I didn't want to be ridiculed. I didn't want to be on a social spectrum for influential people to call me a heretic. She's wrong. She's leading people to hell. All this stuff, I've gotten that from the Pentecostals. I've gotten that from Christians. I've gotten that all around. 
And um, that is the fire I've needed to actually uproot pride out of me. It's testing me um, to, to be me at all times, to not bow to that accusation. It's the accusations against influence, the accusation against revelation. And uh, yeah, um, I think that's about it. Um, I feel like I covered just about all of it. Like, um, I guess an added thing is just who I'm called to is a part of the humbling process too. And, you know, getting free from something, I could just run off into the shadows and never speak again, never share what God gave me to help another person who needs it. God's like, no, you're a voice, you're anointed to destroy religion, to uproot this stuff, to expose it, be bold and say what needs to be said. Don't be afraid. Don't fear any man. Don't fear anybody. Don't be intimidated, you know? So I embrace my boldness and I will going forward with the help of God, by the grace of God, I will do what I'm called to do. I have grace for what I'm called to do. And, uh, it matters not if someone else thinks I'm not doing what God has called me to do. I know my father's voice and the stranger I will not follow. And that's what matters. So I guess a cap capstone keep saying capstone statements, the last thing da, da, da. I'm just remembering. So just to speak to each leader that I came across in my life, I thank God for Danny Johnson, for Chris Lasala, for Torben Sundergaard, Todd White, Dan Moeller, um, TB Joshua, um, David Danielson. I hadn't said his name, but my pastor in Kerrville, like God bless all of these amazing people in my life. Um, yeah, each and every one of them. Um, I just want to say, like, I guess publicly in a sense of what God has shown me now is like, I was wrong. I was wrong against each one of them in each one of those seasons. And the relationships I cut off, I repent. I'm sorry. And, um, that's not what it's about. God awakens a person to awaken others. And as the body, if I'm doing the cutting off, I might be the one who is the bridge to bring something, to bring revelation, to bring the new wine, to bring like that habit of I'll reject you because you're going to reject me thing. I repent of that. I've been doing that with friendships. I've been doing that my whole life. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to say that, that I'm seeing the puzzle pieces that all these different people have. I'm like, that's some real power over there. That's some real deliverance. That's some real healing over there. Um, yeah, like, I'm just so thankful that I'm like, I can acknowledge the good in people and acknowledge what they carry, what their giftings are and what, what fruit they're bearing. And then, Maybe by relationship, like they're adding something to me, I'm adding something to them. So, um, yeah, I just, as a statement of my life at this time right now, what God is showing me is I, I want to embrace what it looks like in this next season for me of what I'm to do, what I'm to, um, who I'm to connect with, what type of work I'm here to do, what my mandate is, you know, um, I'm working on, uh, recording my very first album. I'm just starting on that journey. I'd like to release it in 2025. Um, so a project of 2024 for me, um, I'm starting a life coaching business. I just joined a home business called live good. And, um, that's something else I'm seeing myself building. Um, my life coaching business is typology corner, that channel, my music, um, and then ministry on this channel. i I want to get out in the community and heal people and uh, minister to people and like just start making content with other people in it and uh, documenting God moving, you know, and uh, a lot of stuff. Like I can see myself doing documentaries and stuff. I'm moving to Kenya in a few years um, and getting these online businesses started and stuff. Um, 
yeah, I know I'm heading places and God's showing me at every point for the next place, you need to make right the things you did wrong. And, um, I'll just speak briefly to the people that God has brought in my life. God has absolutely surrounded me with people who are walking in their identity, who are spurring me on. And I'm just so grateful. Like every time I met a new, I met my husband, I met my spiritual parents. I met, um, just a whole amazing, just so many amazing people, but that, that are, that are, uh, just fully themselves. And it's encouraging me to be fully myself, you know? And I'm blessed right now for who, you know, God has brought into my life and, uh, the journeys God's walked me through to bring me out of religion. Even since meeting my husband, I've gone through so much and like walking away from the, the structures of Christianity that are completely man-made, um, that I can build the kingdom and do my work free and to set other people free to flow with the spirit in the kingdom and not in um, these structures that are just limiting, confining, um, they're ineffective can, in comparison to what the spirit wants to do. Um, but yeah, I'm just very grateful for this time in my life where I'm beginning to embrace my voice, embrace boldness, embrace truth, embrace my influence is not a bad thing. I'm at a point where I'm starting to be very like tuned in. Like I know what I'm here to do. And I'm just, it's on the to-do list today. Like, let's go, you know, let's do it. And, um, I just want to stay faithful, um, in this ministry, in my life calling. And, uh, yeah, thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Um, I pray this has been a blessing to you in some way. Um, I'd love to talk more about this. I'm sure there's aspects of this. I'm like, oh, I, I meant, you know, I wanted to talk about this other thing, but, yeah, it's just given me a lot of grace to see. Um, I had to see this stuff in myself so I could stop just projecting it, that it was only outside of me. As I get it out of me, as I really let God uproot this pride out of me, I can then now speak on pride. That's what God was showing me. You can talk on it now because you went through the fire. You went through the fire. You've been tested. And I've been burned, burn, 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 burn. It's the best thing that could ever have happened to me. And it's birthing everything. Like the fire is a good thing. I welcome it in my life. I welcome persecution in that sense. I wouldn't even call this stuff persecution because it's kind of dramatic, but it's just the things I don't want, the outcomes I try to control, the things I don't want people to do. I don't want people to you know, be against me or whatever, just in any sense, you know, that, um, I need to be, I needed to be free from that. And as God is uprooting that and God's sending me back, like I went to my 10 year class reunion and it was the most healing thing. I was like shaking the whole time. Um, I went and visited, um, my neighbors again too. And I was like manifesting that I was just like, so much was coming up in me. And I was just like, this is like, to be back in the place where I was right before I found Danny Johnson and went on this 10 year journey. Oh my God. It was so healing, but like there's, it's bringing stuff up and it all needs to come up and wow. Yeah. More to come, <laughs> more to come this journey but like God is awakening me and I see there's there's a lot of relationships that God is showing me hey reconnect 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 I see that on so many areas of my life from every season every place and um it's a humbling experience the more so I say I've overcome pride but it's the journey of overcoming pride I'm showing you the whole journey how God's doing it. I just want to open the window and let you see it. And I pray that it's a blessing to you in understanding that Holy Spirit will bring you on an uncomfortable journey because she is the comforter. She will comfort you because you need it to walk the journey, but it will set you free. It will set you absolutely free. It's the best thing in the world. So, um, yeah, if you need any help, um, you can jump in the discord server, uh, in the link below, uh, in the description below, um, that is a community of believers, of people in all different places. 
in their faith, um, getting to talk and chat. Also in my business, if you want life coaching based on your personality type, based on your patterns, I offer life coaching um, hourly on Zoom. Uh, you can book a free consultation on my website, typologycorner.com. You can find my other YouTube channel by going to this channel and scroll down to the bottom. I have the other channels linked there. I have my worship channel linked there. I have um, Typology Corner linked there. I have my husband's channel. All, all those are resources to you if you want to go and learn more about the Enneagram, um, MBTI, Objective Personality, all of that. That's been hugely um, helpful for me. I've even had a journey of picking that stuff back up for how much it was ridiculed um, when I first got obsessed with it, right? And I realized it so has to do with my calling. That's why I couldn't shake it, you know? But yeah. Anyways, this is the work I'm called to do. I just became certified. I just finished my certification um, as um, a Enneagram life coach. I went through the whole process and uh, been launching my business in the last month. Got my LLC established, like everything. And um, yeah, and then network marketing is popping up again. Like I found this amazing company called Live Good, and I'm excited to share more about that in the coming days. And um, all these things that God showed me in that letter that I wrote, that my pastor read, that he wrote on and scribbled on and that I deleted and got rid of. And I, don't, I really wish I had kept it, but like it's all coming to pass right now. Like all of it's coming to pass. And, um, I'm just grateful. I'm just so grateful. And I have tension in my shoulders now in my neck. Like I'm going through, I'm getting more freedom right now as I choose to be free. I choose to be free because I am free. I step into it. I use the freedom I've been given and I have the freedom to speak, to be a voice, to uproot evil and be me really it's being me so this is all that i am so all right guys thank you so much for listening and um yeah i uh had some interruptions in there i'll get all that together <laughs> but uh yeah guys thank you for listening and um i will see y'all in the next one like just thank you for being on this journey with me hearing me out i really appreciate it um, if you got value out of it, do give me a thumbs up. I really appreciate that. Like, I love seeing that it made an uh, impact and helped you in some way. Um, Enneagram two here. I love, I love feedback. So, uh, words of affirmation kind of person for sure. <laughs> That's kind of crazy to say in a YouTube video, but yeah, guys, I do appreciate each and every comment that you leave. I read every one of them, everything. Like I love the dialogue. So, um, yeah, if there's any questions, anything you want to hear more about, let me know. I'd love to continue to make more videos, um, about anything around all of this. So I'm happy to share my journey. Um, yeah, as God shows me to. So, all right, guys, see you next time.